Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by River, the place that I personally go to securely invest in Bitcoin with confidence and with zero fees. I think I heard sailors say, you know, if it's good for a million, it's good for 10 million. If it's good for 10 million, it's good for 100 million. And if you take that concept and you start, you know, applying $10 million per Bitcoin times 100, you start looking at those numbers, they're staggering. That is financial strength because they have the ability to use those assets as collateral to generate a yield. This one, I'll tell you what, Jeff, I have been excited for this conversation since it just kind of percolated up out of Twitter just a few days ago. I've been sitting here just like really kind of excited to have this because I think this is going to be a really, really engaging conversation. So <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Excited to be here. Uh, excited to share some game theory, some analysis and, uh, you know, a little bit of off the wall thinking. Yeah. I love that. So for people that aren't familiar with the banter on Twitter, the back and forth and whatnot, uh, we are, I, I'm a shareholder of MicroStrategy. You're a shareholder of MicroStrategy. Everybody is talking about, uh, price targets, what they think about what Michael's doing, this and that. But what I want to do is is start off um, helping people because here's the thing about MicroStrategy. It's so dang volatile. Uh, you know, as a Bitcoiner for nearly a decade now, like one of the things that, that we hear so often is like, how do you how do you get on the horse or how do you it's almost like you're trying to jump on this speedboat that's coming past the dock. And it's so it's so volatile it's moving so fast that it feels like there's never a right moment to get on it and i would just emphasize that i think micro strategy and i'm sh i'm sure you agree with this is like 2x or 3x harder to jump on than bitcoin <laughs> itself and so what i really 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 want to guard against is people will see me and you and others talking about micro strategy on twitter and they're just like all oh, these guys uh, seem like they know what they're talking about. I want to buy micro strategy and follow and, and own it as well and follow along. And what I guess the way I want to start off the show is I want to just talk about my position that I, that I took in micro strategy, the price that I took it, not to like try to, uh, show off that I got it at a great price. It's more to show people how, where I was when I, when I took that decision and what, uh, financial analysis I was doing to make the decision and then kind of like how I'm looking at my participation in it moving forward so that we can add a whole lot of context to all these comments that I know people are going to see on Twitter and elsewhere. So um, I know, and I don't like to start off shows where I'm talking so much. I, this is an <laughs> interview with you, but this is something that I've, I've really wanted to do because I know I'm talking about micro strategy a lot online and I don't want people to have this impression that they should go out and buy it right now because I'm not saying to buy it or not buy it. I'm just trying to cover it. And obviously, because I have a position, I'm very interested in it. So all of that aside, this is, uh, I'm going to go really fast. And then I want to throw it over to you because I want to hear kind of your point of view. But real fast for the audience, my basis for my very first buy in uh, MicroStrategy, and this was a one-time buy that I did. This was in an IRA account for both of these positions that I'm talking about. Um, this was in uh, the 21st of November, 2022. I paid $159.63 for my basis on the first buy. The second buy was more recently in in uh, January, uh, the 22nd of January of 2024, when the price of MicroStrategy dropped below what the treasury value, the Bitcoin treasury value was. There was this really short moment. It got down to like 460, 450, somewhere in that range. And I was valuing the treasury over, it, it was over $500 at the time when I, when I bought a leap, a long uh, call option. Uh, I, I just bought it at the strike of 470. The price at the moment was at 470. I didn't do it out of the money. Um, and it matures. I did, since it's a leap, it's long dated. It's a 19 December, 2025 call. So there's over 600 days that remain on this. And again, it's in an IRA account, so I don't have the tax ramifications. So those are my two positions. I have not added to those positions. I don't think that I will add to those positions. I think I'm just going to continue to squat on those, those like really what appear to be really well-timed positions. And so as I continue to talk about it in probably a year from now, I'm 
going to probably still be sitting on these positions and I'm not going to be selling them and I'm not going to be adding to them. And I think that that's really, really important context for people. All right. Sorry to talk so much. I want you to go and kind of talk through the same kind of the same kind of setup so people can kind of understand where you're coming from with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's that's a fabulous context. I, I was uh, I had a, I had a similar situation where I, where I purchased MicroStrategy for the first time in 2021. Except I was at the very peak. I, I bought it at the very peak. So I I kind of rode the GameStop wave. Um, yeah. I, I made a crazy investment decision where I liquidated my entire portfolio. I bought GameStop shares. I rode that wave to the top, exited when sentiment broke, and ended up having to figure out where to put that money over the next couple of weeks after that. So mm-hmm. part of it was in Bitcoin. I didn't, I was, I was still in that period where I was trading Bitcoin and I didn't really understand what it was. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of volatility. I didn't really know what was going on, but I was also fascinated by the fact that there was a company that moved hundred percent of their cash assets over to Bitcoin. I was like, wow, this is incredible. What's going on? This, I've never seen anybody do this before. This is just so strange. Um, yeah. So Jeff, uh, give folks uh, real fast, uh, just a background on what it is that you do and what your background is. Yeah, quick, uh, quick background. I am a reinsurance broker. So I sell insurance to insurance companies. And so what that effectively does is it diversifies weather risk and insurance risk across the globe. So we take uh, tranches of weather risk from you know large insurance companies and and diversify those. So we'll have uh, anywhere from you know, 10 to 50 reinsurers on any one individual risk tranche. And we're out selling those to individual reinsurers across the globe. So I've got a, I've got a unique perspective on how big money kind of moves really, because it's, it's insurance for insurance companies. And the reinsurance market is highly dependent on current rate environment, uh, opportunity cost of capital. Um, there's different types of insurance and reinsurance to allocate to. Uh, different locations, different regions. And so that understanding of the insurance market and the reinsurance market and how insurance and reinsurance market cycles work has given me a unique perspective on how the stock market works and how all of the capital world kind of fits together. Mm. And I I think that's the uh, why I might have a different perspective or a unique perspective compared to other people, because I'm, I'm seeing I'm seeing the big money moves from the from the from the top down and looking at it almost like a chessboard as opposed to being from the bottom up looking at trying to understand what's going on. Let let me ask you this because I think this is important context too. It seems like uh that you're a little bit more of a trader or that like you would be looking at this position if it blew out to like some of these crazy numbers that we're going to get into that you're that you're saying that you think it could go to, you would you would potentially exit that position whereas I am a very long-term holder. Like from my point of view, if I could own MicroStrategy and never sell it in my entire life, I would probably do that. If I think that the, if I think that the fundamentals will still remain there and that they deploy their treasury and like this whole other stuff that we're going to get into, um, yeah. I really just never want to realize. And I again, it's in an IRA account, so I don't really have this problem. But I just have this inherent bias that I buy things very, very long and I try to never get rid of them. And if the volatility blows out like crazy and we can talk about what that, what the ramifications of that might be for micro strategy, uh, I'm more looking at it from the lens of Michael's going to do what Michael does and he's going to do it really well, better than I could do it. And I'm just going to let him do his thing because he's a pro, right? Yeah. So I'm so curious, I, I, is that correct? Is that correct? No, frame? definitely not. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly not a trader. I was a trader for the GameStop, uh, the GameStop play because that was yeah. a that was a that was a dynamic that I was seeing in the market that it felt like wasn't going to break, and I, I felt like I was at the front end of it, and I, and I I went through that whole process, and I had to think through the game theory associated with the GameStop trade, and the game theory associated with that was that there were more players in the game than just retail. Mm. Retail was not moving the trade. Retail compressed the trade, but there were also large hedge funds in the trade that were burying Citadel and Melvin Capital. And and knowing that there were other players in the game yeah. influenced how I made decisions. Talk us through the GameStop, like if if you can give everybody an yeah. overview of how it blew out, like what was causing it, uh, who some of the major players were, if you if you do know. Yeah. Um, so 
Yeah, the GameStop trade was it was in- incredibly interesting. So I was following it go from you know twenty to thirty to forty to seventy in a week. Um, I purchased put options on a Friday. I realized I was screwed over the weekend. I sold the put options for a profit on Monday morning and liquidated my entire portfolio. And I bought spot GameStop shares on Monday morning. Um, and then kind of rode that way from 70 bucks all the way up to, you know, 300 or whatever that happened on a Wednesday or Wednesday or Thursday. Robinhood turned the buy button off on Thursday. And that was, I, I will never forget this. I, that was, uh, I still had uh, free capital. I think I just got my bonus or something and I wanted to double down. I was like, I- I'm buying today. I'm buying more of this, this phenomenon still exists. Then I realized I couldn't buy anymore and I could only sell. And at that point, uh, sentiment had kind of, in my mind, had kind of been broken, right? Like it made people think, what is this company actually worth? And you start to zoom out, right? And you're looking at a market cap of, I don't know what it was at, but like 30 billion or something like that. And you, you start to look at over the weekend, I was, I totally ruined a vacation with my wife. (laughs) It's still over one for that. But over the weekend, I was looking at what their assets were. I was trying to value the company, almost doing the, the opposite of what I've done in, in this microstrategy trade. And, you know, starting to realize that there were other players in the game, like the, these large, large hedge funds. I don't know who they were, uh, but I did. I was watching the, uh, the order book and the blocks of trades that were occurring in the order book over time were 20,000 shares. 50,000 shares. And that's not retail. Retail moves, you know, two, three, four, five shares here and there, not 50,000 shares. One of the things that I think is really important with what that you're talking about with GME, when you're looking at it from a market cap size, like it was, it, it was a P, it's really small relative to the size of MicroStrategy and some of these other yeah. S&P companies. And so when you had so much short selling taking place, Four major players, they're looking at this and they're saying, all right, well, if I can, if I can apply this much capital to these short traders, they're going to become forced buyers. I'm going to blow this thing out and I can just liquidate rug pool, get out and, and walk away. But I think a really, really important consideration in that particular trade was the size or the market cap of GME in the face of how many people were talking about it. And that, right. that made it a very unique scenario. And then you had the whole Wall Street bets and like the social media aspect com- combined on top of that of something with such a small market cap. Yeah, it was, a, it was a small market cap. And I think more importantly, it was a small float. I think there were 72 million shares that were tradable at the very beginning when, when, I, yeah. when I looked into this. And I, I, I realized I looked, there were like 60 million shares short. And... <laughs> That is just pretty simple math. Like, okay, if there's, you know, if, if there are more people buying this than there are shares available, then the shorts have to close this position. And it seemed like a no brainer. It's like, yeah, I'm going to take a position because I know other smart people see what I see. And, and that was the, that was my, that was my ultimate strategy. The hardest part was figuring out to exit. And because, you know, there's this diamond hand, I know I'm probably going to get it for this, but there's this diamond, diamond hands, you know, aping in and, and holding, but. I couldn't, I had to figure out what smart money was doing mm-hmm. and, and smart money in thinking about this, right? If they, if they got in at $70 and they wrote it to 300, if, if you've got a, a billion, a, you know, if a $500 million position on this and you just turn 300% return, you just made your entire company's returns for five years in a single trade. And Whereas retail is holding out for 10,000% returns because that's going to change their life. And knowing that the smart money is happy with two or 300% returns and they're likely going to exit, I, I, had, I had to follow what smart money was doing. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, let's, yeah. let's dig into <laughs> micro strategy. No, no, yeah. no. This is good. So let's, let's dig into micro strategy. So when you're looking at it, walk us through how you think about it from a valuation standpoint. How I think about micro strategy. Actually, I kind of want to. I kind of want to get back to this um, trader. Yeah, uh, tra- the, the the trading position. So yeah, um, in the last four years, I've 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 been fully orange pilled. Right, like I'm I'm full uh, Bitcoin, full steam ahead. I've got Bitcoin on cold storage. I think holding it on cold storage and making an on chain transaction is a phenomenally 
uh, worthwhile exercise, right? It's, it's uh, w- once you once you do it on on chain transaction, you see the map, you see how everything works, and then understanding how understanding that there's a company that holds drastically more uh, Bitcoin than anybody else, and likely there's no other company that's going to catch them. I wanted to be on that side of the trade. Thinking about Horizon, um, if you take the same perspective with Bitcoin as you do with MicroStrategy, agree with you 100%. This is a this is a buy and hold forever. And if you if you start to see what Michael Saylor is doing and how he's managing capital, you can do the same conceptual thing with your MicroStrategy holdings. You can use your MicroStrategy holdings in an investment account as collateral to take out a loan to, you know, do with it what you will, like uh, go buy a house or, you know, do do whatever you need to do. Alternatively, there are other other ways to harvest a yield off of long-term holdings with covered calls or covered put options. And there are strategies where you never have to hold or you never have to sell your MicroStrategy holdings in perpetuity. And I think having that thorough and fundamental understanding and thinking a little bit differently um, helps provide perspective on the MicroStrategy trade. Uh, I think the really interesting part to me is that Bitcoin effectively undermines the entire perspective of the MicroStrategy trade, right? You can't un-Bitcoin a Bitcoiner. Right. If if, I I don't, I've never seen it happen. I've never seen somebody that's super pro Bitcoin and ends up switching gears and ends up not being a a Bitcoiner. Uh, And and those are the people that are holding micro strategy. I think the other thing that I I did want to talk about is that um, I've seen a lot of these like cold storage maxis where they're. You know, you should only buy Bitcoin in cold storage, or you should only buy Bitcoin ETF, not the not MicroStrategy. There's you know risks associated with it. I I definitely understand and agree that there are risks associated with different forms of purchasing Bitcoin correlated assets, and I think they both have a position in somebody's portfolio. I I think that MicroStrategy is effectively creating a proof of concept of how somebody that holds Bitcoin in cold storage could potentially earn a yield on it. Mm-hmm. And and we can we kind of get into that, but um, well, it, so this is where so when I put on the position uh, back in the day, or you could just say back in 2022, or or even here in January, when I was looking at the at the price, and I'm saying, okay, the price is trading below just the treasury value alone. This doesn't make any yeah. sense. I think that there should be at least a slight premium on top of it. Um, just being very conservative in, in my valuation process. And I'm looking at the underlying Bitcoin and I'm saying, I think that in this coming cycle, I think it's totally in the realm of possible to go between 300,000 to 500,000 on the price of Bitcoin within, uh, by the, the, the call date of December of 2025. So when I'm looking at that and I was looking at the value of the treasury, um, it, you know, the treasury at the, at the time, let's just ballpark it and say it was worth $500 a share, the Bitcoin in in each share was worth about $500. Um, and so I'm saying, okay, so let's just say at 10 X's from here would be a, a reasonable estimate. So the, the treasury values 5,000. And I think that the shares should be, uh, in this cycle, I'm, I'm just kind of valuing in a very short term kind of way. I'm looking at that. I was like, I can do these calls at 470, a strike at 470. And I think they're worth in excess of 5,000 a share within 18 months. So it was just kind of a no brainer for me. And, yep. and the valuation for me was just really simple because I was completely discounting and not even trying to value the longer tail to all of this, which we can t- kind of talk about next. Um, but just, I guess, uh, you know, as a, as a Buffett investor and kind of looking at it, I was like, okay, this is just, this is just obvious. Like this one's not even hard. The value, the value's there. Like I'd be crazy to not like lock this in right now. I'm curious is. Was for you? Was it a very similar process, or were you looking at this very differently? Yeah, it it was a pretty similar process. I mean, I, I really started with the Bitcoin holdings and where I thought Bitcoin could go as a as a as a baseline, right? I, and I was thinking, you know, okay, maybe it goes to two hundred thousand. Uh, you know, what what is their what is their treasury of Bitcoin holdings at two hundred thousand? What is it at five hundred thousand? What is it at a million? 
and and looking at those impacts uh, of to to their to their corporate treasury over time at these different Bitcoin prices, and then and then I tried to zoom out and look at the market as a whole, right? Like um, what what is what is a stock? You know what what is the stock market? What drives value in the stock market? And this is where I really started to apply the game theory associated with the stock market. The stock market is not a casino. A lot of people think it's a casino, but really it's a playing field. It's a dynamic playing field and everybody's playing the game and everybody's got a different strategy. And if you understand the strategy of the different players in the game, and some of the strategies are very basic and very static, if you understand those strategies and you understand the dynamics of the playing board, you can develop a strong strategy to uh, understand where capital is going to move, right? There's there's more players to the game than just retail, just the people that are on Twitter. Um, in fact, just the, just retail probably makes up maybe five percent. Yeah. yeah, like maybe five percent of the stock market. That's that's probably way too much, actually. It's maybe it's two percent. Um, so. Really, I, I tried to zoom out and think about the structural design of the stock market and how how other stocks are evaluated, right? I started I looked at how is Apple evaluated? and and what i what I did is that I created this um, top twenty u s. equity comparison. So I looked at the top twenty equities in the u s. stock market. And I looked at different metrics that people use to value these companies, right? I looked at PE ratios. I looked at liabilities to asset ratios. I looked at multiples on net asset value. I looked at earnings per share. And what, and what I found was there was no one single homogenous way to compare any asset in the top 20 assets. Like you, you I've, I think I've heard you talk about PE ratios, like average PE ratios, there's average PE ratios, but the PE ratios deviate drastically, right? Like, um, I think uh, Eli Lilly's PE ratio is 123, and they're the eighth largest U.S. equity. And so, when, when you start to think about this, so you're like, okay, there's no homogenous way uh, to who compare any of these statistics. So, what is the true, real indicator? Of what a company is worth and how far into the future do investors look at these investments and so in thinking about again like zooming out even further right um looking at uh, microsoft apple some of the, some of the really top ones I, i've really kind of boiled it down to this uh looking at net asset value and kind of comparing some net asset values because the the top companies, in my opinion, the top companies in the stock market, they're valued purely based on sentiment and future financial strength. And future financial strength is a function of profits and revenues in the future or uh, the strength of their assets and how productive their assets can be. And how long they can remain competitive. And, ha- and how long they can remain competitive. A- absolutely. Absolutely. So... That was the perspective I took, and I, and I was trying to think about. Uh, it, it occurred to me that every single one of these companies all had different types of assets. Right? They all had fundamental different business models and ways of generating revenue, and different, um, you know, ways of of utilizing the financial markets. Right? They all have different shares outstanding. Some are. Uh, issuing shares, some are doing share buybacks, some are issuing debt. And there, there's a, an enormously creative and large world of capital markets that can be utilized. And all, all these companies are doing those types of things and doing them a little bit differently. But where, where those large companies really get value is from the passive component of the market, the passive index fund component of the market. So the S&P 500, uh, QQQ, total stock market index, all of those uh, index funds. I, I went, I did some math on this. There's like, actually, I think six percent of Apple's holdings are S and P 500 ETFs. I think it makes up. I think it makes up like 360 billion dollars, mm-hmm. right? And, and that's that's a whale. That is an absolute whale, and they're not going anywhere. Any future dollars that are going to S and P 500 ETFs, 
they have a market cap weighted allocation that's going to Apple. Mm-hmm. And so, so this this kind of gets into the fundamental design like of the stock market. I mean, who's investing in these passive ETFs? And it's pension funds, it's insurance companies, it's endowments, it's um, you know, everybody with a 401k and they don't want to they don't know what to do with it. So they're just putting it in index funds. And I think there's a large, a very, 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 very large pool of capital in the stock market that is just a passive zombie and not really doing anything. Yeah. So if you know that there's this large chunk of capital that's a passive zombie in the market that's not doing anything, the value of a stock is actually everything else that's trading on the margin. So (laughs) it's actually a very small number of shares that people are trading that are determining the value of the stock. Mm -hmm. And if, if the sentiment of those small, of that small uh, tranche of people that are trading the equity changes or shifts, that's, that's how you would see any, any change in like these large or, or, or any equity really. It's, it's, it's what's trading at the margin, not everything else. Mm-hmm. So, very very long winded way of thinking about the market. That's how I that's how I think about the market. I, I take this like very very high level view. So then then I look at MicroStrategy, right? And they've got at the time when I was doing this, they had like one hundred twenty seven thousand Bitcoin, and it was more than ten x the next closest company uh, with Bitcoin, mm-hmm. and <laughs> I I was trying to think my way through, like okay. Who can catch them if this is truly the new uh, financial ecosystem, the rails of the new financial ecosystem? Who could who could possibly catch them? And if I think I think I heard sailors say, you know, if it's good for a million, it's good for ten million. If it's good for ten million, it's good for a hundred million. And if you take that concept and you start, you know, applying ten million dollars per Bitcoin times a hundred, you know, what two hundred five thousand now? you start looking at those numbers, they're staggering. Yeah. And that is financial strength because they have the ability to use those assets as collateral to generate a yield. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that most of, most of the market misses is that, um, Bitcoin is eventually going to be used as collateral and it's already being, it's already being teased out right now. Right. You start to see these loans where you could start to use your collateral, your Bitcoin collateral to get a loan to go buy a house. Um, MicroStrategy is effectively going to be the bank in the future offering liquidity for, uh, for Bitcoin uh, financial system in the, at some point in the future. Mm-hmm. They don't need to do it now. It's too, way too volatile to do it now. But as the number of coins mind uh as we get to you know 2034 where 99 percent of the coins have been mined the volatility is likely going to have reduced decently from from that point of view if i'm michael and i'm i'm looking at like what risk premium i would need to lend them out like you would you would literally laugh in my face if i said the number because yeah. i'm looking at the return that i'm gonna get just naturally through the appreciation because of how early we are in the timeline. And I'm saying, uh, you'd have to pay me like, you know, well over 50% annualized for me to assume that risk that you're going to actually pay them back to me. Um, and so anybody who's not valuing them at, at some crazy level like that, or I guess it's not crazy. It's very rational why you would want that type of uh, return to lend them out. Um, you you realize why he's not doing these fancy things with it. And there's no reason to do any th- fancy things with it. And right. probably 10 years out or whatever until it, there's going to come a time where you can start to do this in a way that, you know, maybe it gets down to 20%, 30% to start lending these things out uh, in the early days of, of it kind of starting to make sense. And again, we're probably talking 10 years from now <laughs> before we get to that point. But I love your point about, uh, you know, he's going to effectively become a bank with with this treasury, and he's also going to be looking at the economic calculation of all the other equities that uh, that exist, and them now being re-denominated and recapped in Bitcoin terms. And I think that I think we're going to see PEs down to five or whatever. They're definitely not going to be thirty-five. That's for dang sure. 
And so your point that you bring up about can anybody catch up without there being massive amounts of slippage? Because the, the amount that Michael would have to be paid to sell the company outright or to, <laughs> to collect his treasury, I don't think that there could be a number for him. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I, I, I don't. I don't think there's a number. I also agree with your your loan terms, right? I, I don't think this is a short term perspective. However, it's it's naive to not consider it. Mm -hmm. You know, ten twenty years from now, the price of it, Bitcoin is going to be far less volatile because there because there's going to be much more. It's just the 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 way that the S curve and the adoption curve works. Yeah. Bitcoin is going to be far less volatile on a relative numbers scale and basis. Mm -hmm. And it all comes down to like actuarial science. If you're able to throw a, a volatility charge on, um, you know, what Bitcoin price is moving and, and where you're generating your yield from, mm -hmm. um, that uh, it, it will all be able to be calculated at some point in the future. Yes. If you think about the current global economy and how things are produced and, and how the world kind of works. I, I tend to boil it down to um, there, there are two major components economically that allow the world to function, and it's uh, lending and insurance. Mm -hmm. And because if, you're, if, you're, if you have a business idea and you want to go start a business because you think you can go um, make disproportionate amount of money, you need to go get a loan from somebody to run with this idea. So that's that's one component, and then you've got the insurance component. Without insurance, life would be too risky to do anything. Mm -hmm. Without without insurance and without reinsurance, life would be too risky to do anything. And having both of those components are necessary for kind of a, a functioning economy. And it, if we're going to think about a Bitcoin denominated world, you need to have lending, and you need to have insurance. And if you're looking at a company with you know, more than 10x of the amount of Bitcoin of anybody else, I think they're going to have the opportunity to get into these ventures with lending and potentially insurance mm -hmm. and, and generating a yield off of those functional business structures. Jeff, let's, let's get into uh, the thing that I think you and I had a little bit of back and forth on that maybe we see this a little bit differently. Uh, with respect to capturing the spread, I am. Uh, I love. I love this. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of beating the drum and and to be quite honest with you, just kind of having fun and like tagging, <laughs> tagging Michael. And I know he can't respond, and I don't want him to respond. But uh, when I'm looking at like right now today, and and it's so funny because literally back in January, February, the 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 price of MicroStrategy was at parity or even above the Treasury value today. I would say that the treasury value is around like uh, the Bitcoin on, on his treasury is worth about $800 a share. And the, the, uh, the post market closed today, it's sitting at 17,800, uh, I'm sorry, $1,784 per share. So you have basically a thousand dollar premium above the, the treasury just since January, February. Um, and uh, that is massive. That is huge. Yeah, and so I'm looking at this, and uh, and he's obviously been announcing all these uh, convertible debt deals recently. He did an 800 million dollar convertible debt deal. Then early, just a couple of days ago, he announced another one. I think it's 525 million uh, that can be converted into common stock, and I think it's at like 85 bips. It's like a pittance the interest rate on what he's getting here because he's. To be, and this is what's so crazy for fixed income. This is probably one of the best fixed income instruments on the planet right now to buy. If you have a mandate to own fixed income, people are looking at it and saying, there's no yield. Like who, wh what idiot is buying this? And I'm looking at it and saying, no, you don't understand. This is literally the best fixed income thing that you can possibly buy if you have a mandate for it. And, um, and then the, the, just as one other point to this. People are completely missing how important and how valuable this is for Michael's other strategy, which is to convert the common stock spread into more Bitcoin onto his balance sheet when it's trading at a premium to his treasury. Okay. And, and the reason why is because all of these convertible fixed income instruments are able to provide deep liquidity 
into the common stock. Okay, that's what's lost because you have all this Wall Street fast money that you kind of addressed earlier in the show that's coming in and they're hedging both sides of this. They're trying to capture the spread. They they don't they are not long-term holders. They're in and out. They're taking a short position and they're just trying to get a risk-free return. But what that does is it adds absurd absurd amounts of volatil- uh, of of volume to the common stock because of these convertible debt instruments that he keeps uh, issuing. So it's almost like this uh, scenario where he is able to capture this common stock spread to the treasury by because he has such deep liquidity. I literally saw today he had the same uh, volume of trade as Amazon today, which for people that aren't like following along is totally nuts nuts for the for the market cap size of his company to to have this. So if I'm trying to put on that trade where I'm trying to issue all this common stock, transmute it into Bitcoin, and I have deep li- liquidity in the common stock, like I can do that all day long because there's so much liquidity. Um, I think Wall Street is totally asleep at the wheel. And now to, to the point where you and I were kind of going back and forth, you were suggesting hold off because the spread's going to blow out more. And I'm just saying, I don't want to pl- I don't want to get greedy, like be this little piggy thinking yeah. that I can perfectly time that. And I'm just saying, just capture the, just capture the spread. You're yeah. it's a thousand dollars right now. Just capture the spread. So let me hear your point of view on, on, and I think some of this goes to your GameStop experience. Why, why do you think it's yeah. even more absurd than a thousand dollars per share on the spread? One of the most common questions I get asked from family and friends is Preston, where do you personally buy your Bitcoin from? And the answer is really simple. I buy it on river.com. Not only can you easily buy Bitcoin with zero fees on recurring orders, you can have peace of mind knowing Bitcoin on River is held one-to-one in multi-sig cold storage, all while being fully licensed and regulated in the United States. Plus, their relationship managers are US-based and available by phone for you or your business. Additionally, River has built their own infrastructure from the ground up, which means they don't rely on third parties to function like other Bitcoin exchanges. River also just created a new feature not found anywhere else called River Link. It allows you to send Bitcoin over a text message to easily orange pill your family, pay a friend for dinner, or send a gift. There's a new standard for investing in Bitcoin, and River is setting it. Go to river.com slash fundamentals and get up to $100 free when you sign up and buy Bitcoin. That's river.com slash fundamentals. I think it's going more absurd. You know, I've tried to think through this uh, volume conundrum a little bit on the microstrategy, uh, daily volume. And I think it's a total misnomer of the actual shares trading at the margin. Because I think there's a bunch of HFT, high frequency trading algos that are trying to capture risk free premium based on, you know, some underlying fundamental algorithm pegged to Bitcoin. And I think that is a, it's not real volume. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. So you don't, you think, I, that even though the numbers are there, that, that it could disappear pretty quickly. I think the, the actual number of shares trading at the margin is far smaller than the, what the volume indicates. And I think that's why we're seeing the premium grow at such a rapid pace. What, wh- uh, why is that? Why are you saying that? The, I'm saying that because the float is so incredibly, uh, like the shares outstanding is so incredibly small. You've got, you got 17 million, seven, well, whatever, people are going to argue about that. 17 million shares outstanding per se. Uh, Sailor's got 15% of them. You've got uh, ETFs that have another, I don't know, 30%. Institutional investors have 60%. Institutional investors are not selling this. You've got retail that's that's bullying their head in in here, and so now, like when you start to do some just really rough math, of the seventeen million shares outstanding, you probably have like I don't know, thirteen or fourteen million that aren't moving mm-hmm. at all, and and it might be more than that. And I, I would argue that it probably is more than that. And so, really, you may see these massive volume figures. But I think those volume figures are a total misnomer because what's actually trading at the margin of people that are actually buying and people are actually selling is much, 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 much smaller. So Jeff, but doesn't that go to my point of saying capture the spread now while you can get it? Because if you yeah. sit on and wait, you're going to be too illiquid and you're going to get, you know, you're, 
you're playing a fool's errand of trying to time something like that when you should just capture the spread. Yeah. So my, my, my comeback to that is that more passive money is coming and people are holding, mm -hmm. right? People, people are holding the S&P 500 entrance. No, 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 not the S&P 500, right? Okay. I, there are, MicroStrategy is already included in a handful of market cap weighted indexes, mm -hmm. index funds. One, one being the uh, Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. You've got all of the Russell index funds. They're in the Russell 2000. Um, you've got many index funds that they're already included in. So passive money comes into this trade monthly, probably daily. You know, there's no great way to see like when it exactly comes in. Mm -hmm. But passive money is going to come in. And as the market cap rises and those, those funds rebalance and, and reallocate the weight distributions of their total funds, the, the, the relative proportion of new dollars coming in is going to be lo a larger proportion of the fund. Mm -hmm. So forget the S&P 500. Uh, it's, it's a great story. And if it happens, it's, it's, even, it's jet fuel to this thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you already have passive money that's coming into, uh, into the transaction. So what do we know about Bitcoin? There's some pretty big events that are on the horizon in the next month and a half. And we've got the halving and, you know, there's, there's a lot of, you know, both scenarios going on here. You've got quantitative easing, interest rates, you know, every, everything that's going on. And I, th I think it, I, my, <laughs> my argument was just be, I think you can be strategic and I'm sure they're, they're calculating some like acceler relative accelerations in the price of Bitcoin relative to the price of micro strategy, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of rate of return. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a, you could take the derivative of that curve. And once you, once that rate, the relative rate of change between Bitcoin and micro strategy changes, that's the time to issue new shares. Mm -hmm. Um, th to, see, to ma maximize the, the relative premium. Do you ever see, uh, one of these, and, um, this is going to sound like I'm going off topic, but like, I'd like to use, uh, nature or physics to try to help me think through problems like the one that you're, that you're talking about. There's this, there's this visual of this ball that like drops down and it has volatility versus one that you start and it just like is at it a 45 flat. degree angle and, and goes yeah. down. And what you often see in that clip is how the one that has more volatility is actually moving faster than the one that's just going straight at a 45. But what you fail to see is if you run that clip long enough and you keep watching it, the one that's at a 45 actually catches up to the one with all the, the, the volatility and variance and then goes faster than it. So when I'm looking at what, what's playing out here, I see this being a very similar dynamic as that scenario where... Yeah. You, if, if Michael is stepping in and capturing the spread and he's doing it, especially at a price where like when I'm looking at this next cycle and let's say I was bearish and I think we're going to go through another. And if I thought we were going through another cycle, which I think is a huge if, um, let's say it goes to 400 or 500, where's it coming back down to? And I would say a hundred thousand, nine, 90,000 would be the low, uh, It'd call it, what would it be two years from now or, uh, two and a half, three years from now, um, yeah. we would be seeing a low and it may be that it's 90,000. And if that's true, any buys that are the transmutation of common stock to Bitcoin would be bad buys or dilutive to the shareholders. If he was doing that, if he could lock in, uh, you know, if he was, Let's just say he was selling shares and collecting cash and then dropped it all in at, at 900 or 100,000 on the, the next low. Um, that's how he would ensure that he's not dilutive. So with all of that said, I'm looking at the current price and the current Bitcoin price is at $68,700 right now. And I'm saying you got about another 30,000 in Bitcoin where it's a very, very high probability trade to capture the spread. Because if you go through another cycle, it could be dilutive. So like to your point, you're saying, let that spread blow out because I'm with you. It might just blow out to like epic proportions, right? Like that's really kind of your point. You're saying, let that blow out, then let's capture it. Maybe the price of Bitcoins, you know, and I don't want to take words out of your mouth, but maybe the price of Bitcoins 120,000 when you get to that peak blowout. And what I'm saying is you're transmuting it at a, at a basis 
that is higher than where the next low could go and which could result in you actually being somewhat dilutive to the shareholders in that scenario. But I don't know. I, I, th I think this is one of those scenarios where, where all the years that I've participated in markets, I usually get burnt the most when I try to get too cute with things. And I try to like, oh, <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean. When you said it's calculus, like I can't even tell you the red flag that like went up in my head. It was like, that's yeah. a bad idea <laughs> because, it's, because you're saying it's calculus. It's, it's too complicated. It's, it's too complicated. Yeah. It's too complicated. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely, I, I definitely understand. I, I think, um, one of the, one of the points I was getting is like the velocity at that time was rapidly changing. Yeah. And, and. If everybody, if you think about, again, this is game theory, right? Just taking a step out, look at all the players in the game. If everybody that's actually truly holding Bitcoin is also holding micro strategy and the whole ethos of their entire trade is they're going to hold Bitcoin forever and they're going to hold micro strategy forever. I like if this. You, if you know that they're not moving. We call them psychopaths. Have, let's, let's call it what it is. It's there. They're psychopaths. I'm one of them, right? If yeah, you know it's yeah. not moving, like. I am not selling MicroStrategy one, one forever, but why would I sell now when I know the bull market is on the horizon? Yeah. And so, so if you know what everybody, well, you've got institutions, uh, they're not moving. You've got other smart pet, like traders that know what's going on. They're not moving. Everybody knows what's on the horizon. And then you have zombie money coming in the door to try to capture all of the remaining tiny liquid float. Mm -hmm. that that spread is that spread is going to widen and the velocity the the acceleration we, we we've seen it i mean we've seen it in the last three like two weeks yeah no, and, um, and I'm, I'm literally looking at the spread blowing out and you're exactly <laughs> right it's accelerative yeah. the spread that's blowing out is accelerative and um i guess when i'm looking at the the fact that they had so much volume today and i know and i like your argument that maybe it's not actually all there and that might be a little bit of smoke and mirrors but um, I'm also looking at Michael and I'm just like, dude, can you just like issue another like 25% of all your shares outstanding <laughs> and just like capture this spread and transmute it into Bitcoin and like, and then the price is really going to rip because he's going right. to have so much more Bitcoin at such a great basis as we're getting ready to go into an environment where I think we're going to see just absurd moves here in the coming year. Yeah. So Yeah. I, I think that makes sense. Uh, the, uh, when I was comparing what you could do, right? Like you can, mm -hmm. you can issue shares or you can issue debt. I, mm -hmm. I, when I looked at the company's balance sheet relative to the assets that they hold, it's like raising flags, go issue more debt. Um, and, and that's, that's what they did there, right? They went and did this kind of convertible debt bond, yeah. which I, I thought was a, that, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant trade. Um, Not to mention it helps in his taxes. Like it, it reduces his tax burden, the, the interest rates a total pittance, yeah. um, and and the vol the the enhanced volume of, in the common stock is I think the really like crazy qualitative kicker that people aren't thinking about. Yeah, yeah, right. I think the one interesting question I I, <laughs> I I've been talking about this on Twitter a little bit is uh, I would love to be in the room, sitting across the table at those meetings. Can you imagine what those meetings with the executive committee at MicroStrategy is like that when they're oh, trying yeah. to go get six hundred million dollars of, uh, of capital? Yeah. And who who are those people? Right? Are they actual? Are they actual? Um, are they actual funds, or are they maybe sidecars of uh, large uh, corporations that won't? They they know that they won't be able to get a Bitcoin purchase past their board. So maybe mm -hmm. they go buy convertible debt somewhere else, aka MicroStrategy. So I would really love to know who was on the other side of those transactions, and it's super opaque. And I think uh, the fact that you're seeing it being oversubscribed tells you everything you need to know. Yes, it's like we don't need to know who it is. It's just <laughs> right. uh, the fact that it's oversubscribed tells you there's a massive appetite for it. Like when you look at the when you look at who the biggest shareholders are from an institutional standpoint, it's like really smirk worthy uh vanguard and others <laughs> that like uh it's just hilarious and um let me ask you this i i'm of the firm opinion that we're watching something that is uh somewhat 
unimaginable and that is going to absolutely go down in the history books as probably one of the most uh, obscene, uh, tr- I don't even like to call it a trade, but uh, transitions of a company that is going to be a global dominant player in the future. Ten years from now, Mike, everybody's going to know what MicroStrategy is as if it was like Apple stock or whatever. I, I absolutely 100% fundamentally agree with that statement. I, I think I truly think that this is the biggest move, the biggest financial move in the history of finance mm-hmm. and in, in the history of all of finance. I mean, this is yeah. this is bigger than uh, Rothschilds figuring out how to uh, front run in the 1600s and turning into a, a multi, uh, yeah. you know, totally. generational wealth like this is fundamentally beyond comprehension, bigger yeah. than anything that's ever occurred before. Totally agree. Yeah. Um, you heard the Coinbase uh, announcement that they're going to drop a billion into the market. Uh, was it, it was convertible debt, right? I think it was also convertible debt. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I looked at their balance sheet and I don't know if they're using that billion to refinance uh, expiring debt. I, I um, haven't really, I haven't really looked into that much. I, I, I would doubt they're taking as big of a move financially as micro as micro strategy and, and Michael are doing but um if it's a, if it's if it runs as well as their exchange runs it's going to be you know a very poor <laughs> use of funds <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah absolutely so should we uh should we get into some valuations and how, how we kind of yeah, ran was... ran and looked at this a little bit yeah go ahead okay so this is the this is what I used as my baseline this is that uh you know table that I showed where I was looking at you know, all of these homogenous risk characteristics or looking at P ratios, multiples, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I was looking at what MicroStrategy was trading on it as its multiple somewhere around two and a half. And then you would see all of these other companies are trading in the range from anywhere from 1.6 to, to 14, 30 or 60, even in terms of their multiples relative to their net assets, basically their assets minus the debt. Mm-hmm. And to, to me, that's a representation of their financial strength. Mm-hmm. So I I looked at I looked at MicroStrategy and I I took a I wanted to do a dynamic uh, price analysis looking at different Bitcoin prices into the future and how that would potentially impact the market cap uh, at these different Bitcoin prices at different multiples. So in looking at what they're trading at today, they're trading at a two point six eight multiple of their uh, of their net assets. So they're trading at a thirty billion dollar market cap. And then you fast forward and you look at a different, a couple different Bitcoin prices. And so looking at a, a Bitcoin price of 125,000, if you take the same multiple that they're trading at today, 2.68, uh, the, the price of MicroStrategy would be at a $61 billion market cap and a $3,500 price for MicroStrategy. You go all the way to the furthest right on the graph. I've got 275,000 Bitcoin price, which at a 2.68 multiple results in a $143 billion market cap and an $8,000 stock price. Now, thinking about where passive funds, how passive money flows into this, right? You've got the potential S&P 500, which is a boon. You've got potential QQQ, which both are a boon to uh, the amount of capital that would flow into the trade. But regardless, you still have market cap weighted indexes that are going to passively be pushing money into the transaction. And if, if people truly take this strong Bitcoin holder mentality to micro strategy, the number of shares traded at the margin is going to become razor thin and price discovery to the upside will, will tear people's faces off. Uh, <laughs> so, um, oh, Lordy. <laughs> yeah. So I looked at multiple different trading multiples. So, uh, back in 2021, MicroStrategy hit a six times multiple, like when it when it really peaked at about like one thousand mm-hmm. uh, dollars back in in twenty twenty one. They were trading at six times multiple. So I took that same multiple and and looked at different Bitcoin prices with that multiple. At one hundred twenty five thousand dollar Bitcoin price and a six times multiple, that results in a hundred thirty seven billion dollar market cap and about an eight thousand dollar MicroStrategy price. Again, as you could start to see, as you go further, if if your price assumptions for Bitcoin go further out, uh, up to two hundred seventy-five thousand, or I've obviously got many columns hidden here, uh, with a two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars Bitcoin price and a six times multiple, you're looking at thirty three hundred twenty-one billion dollar market cap and eighteen thousand dollars share price. 
So when GameStop had its short squeeze and there was a pr- significant pressure on the remaining float and there was price, price discovery to the upside because the number of shares trading at the margin was so incredibly small, it was trading at a 49 times uh, net asset value. Wow. wow. So in looking at uh, what a 49 times uh, net asset value looks like, at one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar, <laughs> at one hundred twenty-five thousand dollar Bitcoin price, uh, trading at a forty-nine times multiple, you're looking at a one a one trillion dollar market so, cap. So I love I love that you went here, but I would I would push back to a point that I made earlier in the show as far as market cap size. Uh, how much are you attributing like this multiple of forty-nine, even being in the ballpark, just because of the sheer size of what MicroStrategy would be at that point? So, uh, say that one more time. Yeah. So like when we were dealing with GameStop, you're dealing with this really tiny company and, uh, you know, just doesn't have, uh, the volume and, and is, you know, it's a small market cap when you're looking at micro strategy and where this would be and call it a year and a half from now, um, you're kind of dealing with two different monsters. Like the one is, is, is a grown up and the other one's kind of a little kid. Um, so yeah. Can we just kind of copy and paste and say, hey, this multiple is possible, or is is it kind of a function of like how small GameStop was? No, I, I absolutely think this is possible. Uh, the reason being when, again, game, I, I don't like doing the direct comparison to GameStop, but it's a good perspective on what like a short squeeze might look like where you've got very low liquidity. Um, but GameStop, when that, when that trade kind of blew up, there were 70 million shares tradable. Um, with MicroStrategy, there's 17 million shares tradable. So it's much, 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 much smaller. Yeah, right. The market cap is bigger. But like, what is market cap? What is market cap? Market cap is synthetic. You're very, this is such a great point because you're right, talking like, about the margins. On the margins of what are being traded, that's what's driving the actual price. Right. Yeah, man, that's a great point. So, so like market cap itself is synthetic. So... This is the this is the same comparison of of Samson Mao looking at a, a million dollar Bitcoin, right? If yeah. everybody if everybody at the same time decides that they're not going to sell their Bitcoin for a million dollars unless it's a million dollars, and there's no liquidity left, the price of Bitcoin goes to a million. Well, and if, so anybody that's looking at this and listening to what you're saying, they're looking at the price of the BTC, and the highest price you have here is 275k. <laughs> and you just said Samson Miles million. Like, what does that yeah. do to this? Like, don't, yeah. even, don't even say the number because we're getting into it's crazy uh, territory. It's crazy territory. Think we're out of our minds. Like, I know, numbers. totally I know. out of our minds. Yeah. So, but but I but I think the exercise is useful. I think I think I think the exercise of thinking about it is useful, I right? Like, I'm right. a I'm a reinsurance broker. I think about tail events, like what is happening, like at a point zero zero one percent return period. I love that's what that. I think. That's what I think about, and and you have to consider it, <laughs> right? Like, if if you if you're holding an asset and you're and like you said, if you're going to hold it forever, wouldn't you want to think about what it might be worth? Oh my god! Right. Okay. Then you then you zoom out, right? Let, let, let's compare the market cap to any of these other companies. And you go back and you look at this multiple assessment and you, you actually realistically say, who can catch them? Who can catch MicroStrategy today? I don't know that anybody can at this point. I think, there's, I think if, they, if, they, if they try, <laughs> they're just going to blow out the price. I, I don't think gonna, that you're going to get there. I, and I think, you, I think you've nailed it. So Berkshire has enough capital. They're probably never going to do it. Meta, Zuckerberg has 61% voting rights. Well, and well, if, have- you, if you wanted to, he could. But to your point, like they, they have enough quote unquote capital, but what if they actually would attempt to go after it? They're, the price is going to run so aggressively Blow. that they, that they don't have enough capital. Right. Like it appears like they do based off of like, if everything was stationary and not dynamically moving with the, the new participant that enters this, not to mention, we're not even talking about the qualitative side of call it Apple or Berkshire or who, whoever is now implementing a similar strategy as Michael, like you're, what you're not accounting for is the third and fourth person that now has the incentive to also do it because now there's not one person doing it. There's multiple people doing it. Right. This, this is the, this is the biggest game theory situation I've ever come across. Yeah. (laughs) I'm I'm with you. 
I'm with you 100%. <laughs> it's, like, it, it's filled my brain for the last, you know, the 24 months. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's so uh, full disclosure, I don't, th- I don't think I uh, explained it at the beginning. I, 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 per- I made this strategy in February of 2023. And I have more than multiple handfuls of leaps on this. And I, I was developing that strategy over time, recognizing what was kind of on the horizon and where this could potentially go. So like this, yeah. this is my strategy since early 2023 and it's starting to play out and it's pretty insane. I can only imagine. I can only <laughs> imagine. So what, what are the walks with your wife like? <laughs> i'm sure I, I would i'm sure i would have a different uh per- perspective than she would <laughs> i got one other uh thing let's let's get out of this because yep. uh you told me that you were a punter yes uh, and i quickly want to cover this because i find this type <laughs> of stuff i i find elite athletes and people that are just uh able to perform at uh just pinnacle levels what you told me the the length of your longest kick? Tell me this. This doesn't even sound yeah. believable. Yeah, yeah. So I uh, I was a punter. I had a seventy five yard punt. Uh, this was in this was in college. We went three and thirty three in college. So we went two in years in the game. In the game, no, 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 practice. no, no. So in in my four years in college, we yeah. we won three games and we lost thirty three games. So we we went defeated two years in a row. So I got a lot of work. You know, I was I was on the field quite a bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, had a 75 yard punt. They called it, you know, the punt heard around the world. I posted it on Twitter. I don't know. A couple wow. of weeks ago. Yeah. Dude, it was out of, pretty... out of, out of the back of the end zone. I was like my heels on the back of the end zone and flipped the field. I think we downed them on like the 10 or the 15. So was, did you have a massive tailwind behind you? Like give us the environmental <laughs> setup. What's going yeah, on? The environment, it was, uh, it was warm It's Southern California. It was on turf. I just absolutely blasted this punt. Uh, it definitely rolled, <laughs> definitely rolled a little bit, but it went over the guy's head and, uh, and then just kept going. So wow. I, I, I think it was probably, uh, from the line of scrimmage, it was probably 50 in the air, maybe 55. Yeah. Uh, and then, and got a, got a material roll. Yeah. That is awesome. It changed the, it changed the game. We won that game. That was my senior year. Wow. Um, that was the one game we won my senior year and, uh, we turned the field and scored a touchdown right after that. Good for you, man. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, we're going to wrap things up. If people want to learn more about you, do you tell us what, tell us what you got going on. Tell yeah, us. Yeah. Can follow you. Yeah. So, uh, we are, we are going to be available on all streaming services here shortly. Uh, look up quant bros. Uh, me and my buddy Ryan are researching these types of, uh, trades and transactions, thinking about different perspectives on the market, using game theory, thinking high level, thinking really down in the nitty gritty. And, uh, you know, hoping to talk to interesting people that, that think differently and, and think about the markets. I love it. And I love the engagement, uh, that you guys were giving me on Twitter. It was really fun, the back and forth. (laughs) And I, you know what, I really look forward to continuing to interact with you and seeing your success. And, uh, we'll have links to all this in the show notes. So go check it out. Uh, Jeff, what a pleasure. Great analysis. That was really fun. (laughs) Thanks for making time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Preston. Appreciate it. It's just very important that people see the stakes. Yeah. $500 trillion with 10 to $20 trillion, you know, pouring Amen. down the drain every year. Amen. Versus $500 trillion. What happens to the $500 trillion when we close the drain? Yes. You get $20 trillion worth of prosperity per year. 